Good afternoon, all. Good to be back for the uh, the PM service. <coughs> Good to hear we had a salvation out Solwyn, Brother Callum. Uh, anyone else got any salvations out Solwyn today? That's all right. It's good to hear we had one salvation. That was a blessing. All right there. So you're there in Matthew chapter 13. In this chapter, we see Jesus talking a lot about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And one thing about Jesus, when he came to start his ministry, the one thing he revealed probably more than other things was the kingdom of God. Up until when Jesus came, um, there had been teaching about the kingdom of God, but it seems that Jesus' focus was to really to make known the mysteries of the kingdom of God uh, to his disciples and also to the multitudes. We see Jesus had a big focus on, on just sharing parables about the kingdom of God. And look, before Jesus, there was some teaching about the kingdom of God, like especially from David um, and Daniel, even Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. He had some revelations also about the kingdom of God, but it wasn't until Jesus came that we started to see him explain the kingdom of God in a way which hadn't been explained before. And have a look at verse 10 there in Matthew 13, verse 10. And it says there, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So I love that verse there. Jesus saying to his disciples, It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So I imagine they had some fantastic conversations with Jesus. Like, the outside, the, the multitudes, they were spoken to in parables, like in, in, in riddles, if you like, where they, wasn't, they weren't spoken to plainly about the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But with the disciples, all things were explained by Jesus to the disciples. I can imagine what that would have been like, just speaking with Jesus, him just explaining plainly, not in complicated um, uh, language, but just plainly about the kingdom of God. And just imagine them asking Jesus questions and he just saying plainly how it is, just un un unveiling the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And I think that's amazing. And for us today, it's given for us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. For those who have a heart to seek after God and to know these things, so we also can be like the disciples and understand the kingdom of God, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, because we have the words of Jesus, we have the word of God, and we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to help us to understand these spiritual things. And they are spiritual things. You can't understand the kingdom of God unless you have the Holy Spirit. So if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit, you can understand these, these mysteries of the kingdom of God. But have a look at verse 44. I do want to start by looking at a parable uh, from this chapter where Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and just see what lessons we can take from this parable. In verse 44 it says... Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So the title of my sermon is Hidden Treasure. Hidden Treasure, that's the title of my sermon. And we're going to be looking at how now, right now, in our age, the kingdom of God is like a hidden treasure. Okay, so, and there's a couple of things we can take from this parable which can... Explain to, explain to us some things about the nature of the kingdom of God. And the first one is that the kingdom of God, to those who find it, it is like finding a treasure. It's like finding a treasure. So I would ask you, how do you feel about being saved, about knowing Christ, about having the kingdom of God, or being in the kingdom of God? Is it like a treasure to you? This is the point Jesus is trying to make. It's like if you found this field with some hidden treasure, it is of, of enough value that it would be worth selling all that you have, everything you have, just to buy that field so you can have that treasure. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Look, that's how wonderful it is to find the kingdom of God. It's a treasure which is priceless. Like all the treasures in the world doesn't compare to finding the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is trying to emphasise in this parable. Of course, when it comes to parables, as you know, False prophets and unlearned people can take parables and twist them and take them somewhere where Jesus intended them not to go. So, for example, with this parable here, you could say, well, Jesus is saying you have to forsake everything you have. You've got to give up everything in this world to be saved. Like some would say that. It's called lordship salvation, where they teach that you have to have Jesus Lord over everything in your life in order to be saved. And people would twist these sort of parables. But Jesus is not saying that. He's emphasising the value of the kingdom of God, it's like a treasure. Like it would be worth selling all that you have to buy that field to have that treasure. So I want to ask you today, look, what's the kingdom of God like to you? Is it like a treasure? Like 
Think of, um, think of someone who had been, and this is the story of many of us here today, when you've been in false religion or in false teaching and you've been seeking for the truth maybe for years, for decades, and you've just been finding just dry galleys and, and dead ends on your spiritual course, your spiritual journey, and then you find the kingdom of God and you know you've found the fountains of living water, you've found, you found the truth. To that person, the kingdom of God is going to be like a treasure. All the things in the world are not going to compare to finding the kingdom of God. It is a priceless treasure that nothing else compares to. So we want to make sure that we listen to Jesus here and we do look at the kingdom of God as a priceless treasure. This is something we ought to make sure that we, we, we have in our hearts, that we have this joy of finding the kingdom of God and nothing else in the world compares to it. And that's how I have to be, that's how you need to be because like, Jesus would know. Jesus would know that this is what it's like to find the kingdom of God because he's the king of his kingdom. He's been living in the kingdom of, of heaven and he comes to earth, he sees what's in the world and goes, oh, this doesn't compare to the kingdom of God. And he's saying to people, if you find it, it's like a treasure. Sorry, Janice. It's like a treasure. And we need to view the kingdom of God as a treasure, not just a common thing. Like some people, they do. They view the, the kingdom of God uh, as far as finding salvation. It's just like, oh, I'm saved now? Oh, great. Thank you. I'll go to heaven when I die. And then that's just a common thing. They don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. They don't seek to follow on to know the Lord. For them, it's just a common thing, but it, not, it ought not to be so. But I guess this is probably something that as children who are growing up in a Christian home, in a great church, you want to make sure that you don't just look at the kingdom of God as a common thing. Because someone who hasn't had that luxury, who's been out in the world and been beaten up by sin and by life, when they find the kingdom of God, it's like, oh, this is like an oasis in the wilderness. This is, this is incredible. And they can value the kingdom of God, look at it as a treasure, but if you just grow up in a Christian home, it's easy for you not to consider it to be a great treasure. So you need to read your Bible, pray, and you'll start to appreciate the kingdom of God for what it is. It's not a common thing. A few people find it. Like, few people find the kingdom of God. And you found it. If you're in this church or you believed in Jesus Christ, you've found that treasure. But most people will not find. Most people will not find it. And the Apostle Paul, he's someone who looked at the kingdom of God as, as a treasure. Because he was like in false religion, in the Jewish religion, and investing so much time and energy into that false religion. And then one day he found Christ. I'll just read to you from Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. If you can just stay there in Matthew for now. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So Paul, he gave up all his false religion, all that hard work he'd been, he'd been doing when he found the kingdom of God. And for that stuff, that's just garbage. That just is dung compared to being saved, right. but compared to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, compared to being in the kingdom of God, it's all dung. It's all worthless. So I hope you look at all your efforts, all your, you know, attempts at trying to uh, find the truth in the past is, is dung. It's all dung. I, even everything in the world as well is dung compared to the kingdom of God. So look, if you have the kingdom of God, it makes it a lot easier for you to give up sin, give up the world, if you look at the kingdom of God as a treasure, like Paul did, okay? And like Jesus is teaching, like it's a treasure. And if you find it, if you look at it as a treasure, pretty easy um, well, it makes it a lot easier then to forsake worldly things, forsake sinful things, because you have this treasure which is not going to be taken away. You can have it forever. Let's keep, look, keep looking here. So in Matthew 13, look at the next verse in 45, we see another parable on the same thought. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So it's like that priceless pearl, which is greater than all the other pearls to be found in the world. When you find the kingdom of God, it's greater than anything else you can find in the world. And it's worth forsaking everything else just for the sake of that one pearl because it's so valuable. That's what Jesus is just teaching. So the first point we can take from this parable of the, the treasure hidden in the field is that it's a treasure. And the second point is that it's, it's hidden. It's a hidden treasure. So let's have a look at, if you can turn to Luke chapter 17. See, this treasure is not in the open 
for all to see. It's not sitting on top of the ground for people just to walk past and, and see it. It's something that is hidden. It's a hidden treasure. And the kingdom of God right now, it's hidden. You can't see it. So Matthew 17 verse 20 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. So we can't show people the kingdom of God. So when we go soul winning, we're knocking on people's door and they say, look, I'm not going to believe until I see some proof. Well, we can't show them anything because it's a, it doesn't come with observation. We can't reveal the kingdom of God to them. All that we can say is, is it's by faith. You can't see it, so it's going to be by faith. And we do preach a gospel of faith because it's an invisible kingdom. We can't show them the kingdom of God yet, so it is by faith. The only evidence they're going to see is the soul winner knocking on their door. Like, it was great to see Callum get someone say today. The evidence he had was God sent someone to the door to knock on the door to give him the gospel. Someone from the kingdom of God came. And that's the evidence. The sign of the prophet Jonah is what we come and we preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the sign. That's the sign they're going to get in this, in this day and age. But Luke 17 verse 21 says, Neither shall they say... Though here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So right now, the kingdom of God is within me and it's within you if you're a safe person. It's not out there in the world to say, look over here is the kingdom of God, look over there is the kingdom of God. It's within you. And just think about that for a moment. What's it like? You've got the kingdom of God within you. Like when we, wherever we go, we're carrying the kingdom of God. When you knock on someone's door, you're bringing the kingdom of God to their doorstep. We have the kingdom of God within us and turn, I stay there in Luke keep your spot there in Luke 17 but if you can turn to 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 so we have this kingdom of God we have the kingdom of God hidden as hidden treasure within the fields of our hearts it's in the in our hearts and 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 says for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Have a look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in urban vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Just think about it. We have this treasure of the kingdom of God in these broken, corruptible, urban vessels. Like God's allowed us to have the kingdom of God in this sinful flesh. And we carry this sinful flesh. We, well, as we carry this sinful flesh for life, we're also we're carrying the, the kingdom of God within us. And if we understand this, if we understand the kingdom of God is within us, it's going to have a dramatic effect on how you live your life in this day and age. Look, Jesus wants us to understand the kingdom of God is within us. And it's going to have a dramatic effect upon your life. Let's keep reading. We'll see how in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. Because we have the kingdom of God within us, when we get persecuted, uh, beat down in life, like it's, it's not that bad. Because we have the kingdom of God within us. We know we're not just part of a temporary world. We're part of the eternal kingdom of God, and that's within us already. So we, we can't be taken out. Like if you worst case scenario, you get killed for the for the gospel's sake or, or whatever or whatever in life. Look, you're going to be in the eternal kingdom of God. Like you, so that's why we're never beaten to the point where we're just cast down or we give up because we have the kingdom of God within us. Like if you don't have Christ, well, you're without God and without hope in the world. So if you do get for say, if you do get persecuted, that's well, bad. If you do get um, troubled on every side look that's distressing but if you've got the kingdom of god within you you've got christ within you you've got this treasure in urban vessels look, it's not so bad we're going to overcome because greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world we're going to overcome this world by having the treasure of of the kingdom of god within us in these urban vessels and we just have to remember that we carry the kingdom of god with us when we go soul winning as ambassadors of christ we're ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We come in the authority of the king of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We go in his authority, his power, and his name. Not in our own name. We go in his name as members of his kingdom. And we bring the kingdom of God 
to people. Have a look at Luke chapter 10, if you can turn there, Luke chapter 10 and verse 11. And we have to understand when, when we go soul winning, we're not just going alone. Even if you've got a partner, it's not, it's not just you and your soul winning partner. You, you go in the power of the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is going with you. The Holy Spirit is going with you when you go soul winning. We're representing the whole kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is within us. Uh, Luke 10 verse 11 says, Even, this is Jesus talking, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So what we're doing, when we go soul winning, we're bringing the kingdom of God nigh unto people and they can make a decision if they're going to believe on Jesus or reject him, if they're going to receive the kingdom of God or reject the kingdom of God. And Jesus here, he was saying, when you go soul winning to a city and they reject you, you tell them what the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you and you've rejected it. So we've got to be mindful. We're carrying the kingdom of God as ambassadors. That's why we have to make sure we're preaching the gospel clearly. We're using the words of Jesus Christ, the words of the Bible, when we do give the gospel because we're going as ambassadors, not of ourselves, but of the kingdom of God. And we're bringing the kingdom of God. We're representing the kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 12, if, I'll read that one to you if you can turn to John chapter 3. Excuse me. Okay, Mark 12, chapter 34 says, And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst him, uh, just ask him any questions. So sometimes we can bring people so close to the kingdom of God that we can say to them, look, you're not far from the kingdom of God. It's kind of like when you're soul winning, you're giving the gospel to somebody and they're acknowledging it, they're, yes, I understand. And then you say, well, do you want to call upon the name of the Lord? They go, oh, look, I'm not so sure, look, you know. And it's like the kingdom of God is so close, you're just about to enter in. Sometimes the devil sees that and he understands this person is not far from the kingdom of God. And then what happens is, like, the phone rings or the dog starts barking or, or mum and dad come home or someone comes out of the kitchen and says, oh, no, you can't be there talking to my husband. And who are you to talk to my husband? Oh, yes, sorry, dear, I better go back inside. And, you know, how often does that happen when you've got the man at the door listening to the gospel and he's close to the kingdom of God? And then his mum, I mean, his wife comes out and says to him, look, oh, you should not be talking to my husband about this. And, and then he goes, oh, yeah, get out of here. Happened to me and Callum one time, we're talking to... At Baringa, we're talking to this late, uh, this guy, and he's like listening, and, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, and he's listening to the gospel, and he's close to the kingdom of God. And his wife comes out and, and sends send us on our way, and he's like, yeah, you, you better go now. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is, is that sometimes the people aren't far from the kingdom of God when we give them the gospel. And when they say yes and they believe on Jesus, well, they enter into the kingdom of God. And so you're, you're there in John chapter 3, have a look at verse 3. It says there, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, which is talking about the first birth, being born naturally into the world, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So someone enters into the kingdom of God when they believe the gospel. That's how someone enters into the kingdom of God. When we go soul winning, we're bringing the kingdom. If they say yes to Jesus, then they enter into that kingdom forever and the kingdom of God becomes within them. So at salvation, that's when someone becomes a member or a, um, uh, or a member of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and if you could turn back to Luke 17, let's keep reading there, Luke 17. While you're turning there, I'll just read to you from Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, "'Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So when we're saved, we're in the kingdom of God. But Luke 17, 22, but right now it is an invisible kingdom. It's a hidden kingdom, but it's not always going to be. It's not always going to be a hidden kingdom. So now it's hidden treasure within our hearts, but it's not always going to be. And Jesus is alluding to this here. He says, and he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see 
one of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. So he's talking to his disciples about when he goes back to heaven and the disciples are going to be missing spending that, that quality time with Jesus and they're going to be wishing they could just sit down with him one more time and ask him some questions and have some fellowship. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them nor follow them. So people are going to say, yeah, Jesus is out in the wilderness or Jesus is, is in this city and the disciples aren't going to be deceived by that. And we do hear that a in this day, we say, well, Jesus is out in some commune in the outback of Australia. We're like, well, no, he's not. No, he's not, okay? And I remember I'm confessing my faults to you. Many, many, many years ago, I was at a Benny Hinn crusade, and on the last night that I was there, um, it was going to be another night for the crusade, but we weren't staying for the last night we were leaving. And on that night, I remember Benny Hinn saying, Jesus has told me that tomorrow night he's going to appear on the platform right here on the platform tomorrow night and what well, no he's not going to be appearing at a Benny Hinn crusade and Jesus is saying well this is how I'm going to appear this is how I'm going to appear in verse 24 for as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven so shall also the son of man be in 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 his day that's when we're going to see the kingdom of the god the kingdom of god for the first time when jesus returns in the sky like everyone's going to see him yeah. no one's going to be like oh you need to come out over here when you see him well, everyone's going to see him because as the as the lightning just lightens up the whole sky the whole world people are going to going to see jesus as that lightning flashing across the sky so that's when we're going to first see the kingdom of god and then those people who say look i need a sign i'm not going to believe until i see well they're going to see that sign they're going to see jesus return and what are they going to say they're going to cry out to the rocks to fall upon them to hide them for the the wrath of the lamb is going to come at that point they're going to be experiencing god's wrath so now it's the hidden kingdom now it's time to enter into the kingdom of god so what we see jesus he explained the, uh, the kingdom of God to, in parables to those who were outside, like we talked about before. But to the, the disciples, he explained to them the kingdom of God plainly, in plain language and plain words. But more so, he, not just explaining to the disciples in words, he also showed them, literally showed them the kingdom of God. And we'll have a look at that in just a moment. But let me just read to you uh, a parable. If you can turn to... If you can turn to Matthew chapter 16, I'll read to you from Luke 13, and we see Jesus explaining in parables what the kingdom of God is going to be like in the future. I'll read to you from Luke 13, verse 18. It says, Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? And, to, and whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden. I'll just stop there for a second. So that mustard seed, it's in the garden, it's underground, it, it's hidden, you can't see it. And that's what the kingdom of God's like now. It's like that mustard seed which is hidden in our hearts. And it grew and waxed a great tree and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. So one day the kingdom of God now, which is just a hidden treasure, which is just a mustard seed, it's going to grow and become a great tree and everyone's going to see it. The whole world is going to see it. And Jesus gave the, the um, disciples a glimpse, like a foretaste of what this is going to be like. And have a look at Matthew 16, verse 28. Matthew 16, verse 28 says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that's, that scripture used to boggle my mind for a lot of years what, what does that mean like you can understand like in today's day and age if someone said well you're not going to die till you see the kingdom of god you go yep that could happen that could happen the way things are happening in the world but two thousand years ago look no one's going to live long enough to, to see the kingdom of god but jesus showed it to them anyway so this is fulfilled in the next verse and it says and after six days jesus taketh peter james and john his brother and bringeth them up into the uh, and high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, which is Elijah, talking with him. So this is Jesus showing them the kingdom of God. They're literally seeing the kingdom of God. And what are they seeing? They're seeing Jesus, they're seeing Moses, and they're seeing Elijah. So that tells us something about the kingdom of God. When it does come, look, we're going to be with all the saints. Look, that boggles the mind. That's quite something amazing to consider. Like in the kingdom of God, like for a thousand years on the earth, when it's on the earth, look, we're going to be with all the saints. 
you're going to be with grandma, sure, you're going to be with grandma and granddad and, and your unsaved relative. I mean your saved relatives, and also you're going to be with Moses, Elijah, Adam, Eve, all, all, the, all the great characters that were saved in the Bible. You're going to be with them together. That's what the kingdom of God's like. So this is something Jesus is showing the disciples, what the kingdom of God's like. We're going to be all together in one, worshipping Jesus, with Jesus as the king reigning over the world. Look, that's the kingdom of God we've got to look forward to. And let's keep reading verse uh, 4, Matthew 17, verse 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Well, that's, that's for sure. That is, that is, it is good. If thou will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. That's a bit of a, a strange response from Peter, but this is a pretty unusual circumstance to find yourself in. But it appears that maybe Peter thought the kingdom of God was literally coming right at that moment. That the kingdom of God was coming. So he said, look, let's start building the kingdom. Look, I'll start building a house for Moses, for Elijah, and, and for, Je- for you, Jesus. And he, start, he wants to start to build this kingdom because he's thinking it's coming. It must have been such a powerful experience for Peter that he's thinking, well, this is it. It's happening right now. This is what we've been believing for. It's happening. And then what happens? While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then we see the, the vision ends, and it's just him and Jesus, just the apostles and Jesus again. So they had a great foretaste of what the kingdom of God was going to be like. Because I think Jesus, he wanted the disciples to know this is what you've got to look forward to. This is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And we, as believers today, we need to understand the kingdom of God is within us right now as hidden treasure. But one day it's going to be like a great kingdom in the whole world full of all the saints. And we're going to be a part of it. And that's something we need to understand because that's going to help you go through this life. When you get persecuted, when you get uh, afflicted, look, you've got to be able to remember, look, I'm a part of the kingdom of God. I've got so much to look forward to and it's going to help us. Excuse me, got a bit of a cold. And also, if you can turn to Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, I'll read that to you. It says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just Moses and Elijah, it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everyone. We're going to sit down with the saints in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. It's going to be a blessing, something to look forward to. And I hope this is something that's really in your heart, that's a truth that's alive in your heart. Luke 22, verse 28, have a look there. Luke chapter 22, verse 28. And Jesus, he's looking forward to this time as well. It says there, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And listen to this. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father have appointed unto me. So according to your rewards, you're going to have a kingdom as, as well to rule over, which is going to be under Jesus' kingdom. It's going to be in the kingdom of, of God. But you're going to have a kingdom to rule over if you have those rewards waiting for you. As my Father have appointed unto me. Have a look at this. This, is, this should get you motivated to do some work. This should get you motivated to do some soul winning and to live right if you understand this next verse. This, is, this will be the greatest reward available in the kingdom of heaven right here. And the, the disciples are going to have it. it. says that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I think the greatest reward is to be able to eat and drink at the table of Jesus for a thousand years in the millennium. Like what a reward. You can have your own kingdom ruling over with Jesus and be eating and drinking at his table. Look, that is something to get you motivated to. If you love Jesus, look, that should... You know, get a fire burning Amen. inside Amen. to get, get out there, get, get working, get soul winning, get the sin out of your life, live a powerful life full of the Spirit so you can have the potential of this reward. Look, we may not be like the, the apostles. Like, they have a special place for ruling over the kingdom, um, the 12 tribes with Jesus. But you look, you might not get to rule with Jesus like these guys. Or maybe you will, or we don't know. But whatever you get, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be just. You might get to rule with David or, or Samuel or Elijah or Isaiah, Jeremiah. Look, who knows who you get to fellowship with and spend time with like in the millennium. It's going to be according to your reward. But maybe if you don't work hard enough, you'll be cleaning David's mansion with Lot. Who, who knows? You know, we need to get, get to work. We need to get to work. 
this should motivate us. And we do see some glimpses also of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. I just want to read to you from, if you can turn to Psalm 145, I'll just show you some revelation that King David had about the kingdom of God. It says there in Psalm 145 verse 10, All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. Thou shalt speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. That's what we're doing today. We're talking about the glory of the kingdom of God. And when we go soul winning, we're talking about the glory of the kingdom of God. So David's right. He's prophesying what we're doing today. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. The kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Look, what, what a great mighty act that God's done than the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we go out there declaring the majesty of God's kingdom and his, his mighty acts to people. And again, it's connected to the kingdom of God. If you believe on Jesus, then you're part of this everlasting kingdom which is going to endure throughout all generations. And Daniel, I'll read to you from Daniel chapter 7, verse 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of Most High. So God's kingdom is going to be given to the saints. That's you and I. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So all other people in the world, they're going to serve and obey the kingdom of God. And if you've got your own kingdom within the kingdom, well, you'll be making sure people are obeying the commandments of God. It's going to be your job as a ruler over your authority in the kingdom of God. You're going to be making sure that all people are obeying the, the law, obeying the commandments of Jesus Christ, and you'll be enforcing that in your kingdom. Like, that's something to look forward to. You know? Something to look forward to. And maybe if you're in Australia, you'll be once and for all enforcing right laws in Australia and just seeing uh, Australia finally following after the Lord and his commandments. No more Mardi Gras, no more 200 abortions every day. Amen. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, I'll read that to you. If you can turn to... I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. And I want to look at now just how much Jesus preached about the kingdom of God. From the moment he started preaching, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And to the moment when he's about to ascend into heaven, he's still teaching things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So this is something that we need to understand. Like Jesus emphasized it so much in his ministry. I read to you from Mark 1 verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the, king, the gospel of the kingdom of God. So he's preaching straight away the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And look, we're still saying the same thing today. Like the, God, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here in front of you. If you will believe, you can enter into the kingdom of God. It's, it's available. It's at hand right now. And Mark verse 4 uh, chapter 4, verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them which that are without, all these things are done in parables. So Jesus is, is, is preaching the kingdom of God in parables to everybody, everybody, the multitudes, and of course to his disciples. He's making all things plain. Now, and when he sends out the disciples to go preaching the gospel, guess what he's saying to them? He's saying... Preach the kingdom of God. So he's told the disciples to preach the kingdom of God as well. He is, and he's teaching his disciples to do the same thing. So Matthew 6, verse 9. Matthew 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray... Oh, look, we're going to look at prayer first. This is he's teaching them how to pray. Okay. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So when he's teaching them how to pray, he's saying you need to pray for the kingdom of God to come and that thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Right now in the kingdom of heaven, like God's will is being done, but it's not being done yet on the earth like it's going to be done. Okay, so when the kingdom of God does come, well, God's will is going to be done. One way or the other, it's going to be done. It's going to be enforced if need be. But Jesus is looking forward to this time of 
of being in the kingdom of God with you and I and all the saints. And he says here in Mark 14, verse 25, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So this is at the Last Supper. And he's saying, look, I'm not going to drink again from the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you new in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God. And he's still waiting for that. So he's looking forward to it. He's look, I'm not going to drink it until I drink it with you in the kingdom. And that, look, you can just see Jesus' anticipation. He's looking forward to being with us together in the kingdom of God. And this is like a treasure. This is something to look forward to, that Jesus is going to be drinking of the, of the fruit of the vine with us in the kingdom. He said, look, I'm not going to drink it until then. I'm waiting for that time. But now, now look at Jesus giving commandments to the apostles to go preach the kingdom of God. So Luke chapter 9 verse 1, Luke chapter 9 verse 1 says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And you know what? The disciples have never stopped. They've never stopped preaching the kingdom of God. And neither should we. We should continue to preach the kingdom of God. And turn to Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 8, sorry. While you're turning there, let me read to you from Acts chapter 1, verse 2. So you're turning to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 2 says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he's still teaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus' last words on the earth, it's about the kingdom of God. I think it's something we need to understand. We need to not just be in the dark about it. We need to understand the nature of the kingdom of God. And the apostles, they continue on to preach about the kingdom of God. I'll just read you from, uh, well, you're there in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised both men and women. So we see here Philip is preaching about the kingdom of God. If you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. While you're turning there, I'm just going to read to you a few more verses from the New Testament about the, the kingdom of God continuing to be preached. Acts 19 verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts 28 verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, they came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And Paul dwelt two whole years. This is from Acts 28 verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So we see here that Paul is persuading people concerning the kingdom of God. Like he's, he's preaching the kingdom of God to anybody who would listen. And as soul winners, that's what we're doing. We're trying to persuade people. We're trying to convince people to believe. We're not just saying, look, if you feel so inclined today, look, I know you probably don't want to hear this. Like, no, we're trying to convince them. We're trying to persuade them at all costs. And Brother Calum did that today. Like, we need to be persuasive in a good way. We need to try and convince people, persuade people. This is what Paul's doing. He's just trying to persuade people using arguments and wisdom from the Word of God to help people to believe and to try and convince them. And that's how we need to be. We understand the kingdom of God. We understand what's available to these people. If they would just believe on Jesus Christ, well, they can be in, in God's kingdom. We need to be persuasive. We need to try our hardest. Try our, try our hardest to convince people, to persuade people. So, so in light of all this, in light of the kingdom of God, we understand the kingdom of God. It's within us as a hidden treasure. And also we're going to be a part of a great kingdom in the future. So what should we be doing about that now? Let me read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12. So this is where the rubber meets the road for us today, right now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 12, chapter 2, sorry, verse 12. That ye would work, ye would walk worthy of God who have called you unto his, his kingdom and glory, that ye would walk worthy of God who have called you unto his kingdom and glory. So right now we are in this kingdom of God as this hidden treasure within us, but we need to walk 
worthy. And I think when you understand what the kingdom of God's like, it's going to make it a lot easier to walk worthy. But you're not going to be looking after the, looking to, to be somebody great in the world because, look, you've got this treasure. Why, why would you want to be somebody great in the world? Why would you want to run after these worldly riches and, and fame and lust when you've got the kingdom of God? So we ought to walk worthy of this kingdom that we have. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. And while you're turning there, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So we're receiving this kingdom which cannot be shaken, like cannot be moved, this eternal kingdom. Therefore we ought to serve God in an acceptable fashion right now. It should motivate us to live an acceptable life right now. Matthew 6, 31 says... Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek, but ye, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we ought not to be chasing after worldly things. We ought not to be worrying about worldly things. We ought to seek after the kingdom of God first. And remember, who's the king of this kingdom that we're already in? It's Jesus. And Jesus, well, he's a good king. He's going to make sure his subjects have what they need. And he's saying, here, look, don't worry about these things in the world. Like, Jesus is your king. He's going to make sure you have food and clothing, for sure, all those sort of things. You're going to have those things. You're going to have everything that you need to get through this life. Therefore, worry about seeking first the kingdom of God. That should be our focus. Living after the kingdom of God, living according to the word of God. And these are things that we've got to look forward to. And Luke 12, verse 31 says, But seek ye the, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. In verse 32, Luke 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Like God wants to give you the kingdom. I don't know how you feel about the father, but oh, he loves his children. He wants to give you the kingdom. He's looking to, to give you good things. But not just in heaven, not just in the millennium, but right now he's looking to give you the kingdom, to give you good things. Like He's looking for reasons to bless you. He's not looking to hold back from you. He's looking for every reason to give you good things right now. Let me read to you. Uh, have a, I'll get you a turn there. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. So what we're saying now is when we live a life that's worthy of the kingdom of God, this is what Jesus is going to do for us. Uh, Luke 18 verse 28 says, Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in heaven, in the millennium, no, in this present time and in the world to come, Life everlasting. So even right now in this life, if you put the kingdom of God first, he's going to bless you with so much, so much more. So we ought not to be worried about things of this world. Like The King Jesus over you, your king, is going to make sure you have everything that you need. And if you're living for the kingdom of God, you're living worthy of the kingdom of God, Like he's going to bless you with so much because he knows he can trust you. So there's so much we should look forward to, even now in this life, many blessings to come. But right now, I'm just about to finish, but right now, this is a hidden kingdom. We have a hidden kingdom within our hearts, but there's going to come a time where we're going to be a part of this kingdom that all the birds of the air are going to nest in, in the tree of this kingdom. It's going to be a kingdom that, fulfills, that fills the whole earth. And I just want to close on, on this one verse from Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Then we'll close. And this is what we've got to look forward to. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which is a kingdom of God, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It's going to be left to us, not other people, left to, to the saints. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Look, that's the kingdom of God that's within us right now as hidden treasure. But one day, this is going to be the kingdom of God. It's going to rule over all kingdoms, and we need to understand and understand 
the kingdom of God. And, and then it's going to affect how we live our lives right now. We're going to be looking forward to this kingdom. We're going to go preaching the gospel, bringing the kingdom to people's doorsteps so they can also be in the kingdom. So these are things we need to understand. Jesus spent his whole life explaining the kingdom of God clearly. The disciples, they spent their ministry preaching the kingdom of God and explaining what it's going to be like. So I pray that we just trust that, you know, that we can just understand the kingdom of God more and be encouraged by the things which we have to look forward to. And this kingdom's already within us. It's just not, not visible at this stage. But one day, like, it's going to rule over the whole world. All right, let's pray.